is episode 74, and this is the last week of our yarn giveaway. Next Saturday, I will be announcing the winner, so you have one more week, one more week to get your entries in. Um, if I don't sound myself today and I stop to take drinks in between, I'm getting over strep throat. Um, I've been very ill this week, actually, with just general nastiness from strep throat. The doctor said it was the worst case she had seen in her medical history. I was like, yes, I am an overachiever, apparently. So, um, yeah, so if I, you notice me clearing my throat and stuff, that's why I'm trying, I'm just still getting over all of this. So, let's get started. I have several works in progress that are that close to being done. So I have my Drakenfells. I am on the final section of my Drakenfells. Drakenfells is a shawl pattern by Melanie Berg. And you can see from my stitch marker right here, or Progress Keeper, that's where I was last week. And the final section um, is striping. Let me show the entire shawl to you. It starts with the dragon's tail, and Drakenfels means dragon's hill, but this is the dragon tail, and here's the stripes in the tail, and then it comes down, and it eventually works up into stripes. It is a three-color shawl, and the colors I had down here, this is an alpaca, and the gray is a hawthorn from, I believe, Knit Picks. I think it's nitpicks. Um, the two colors I'm in now is the rest of that Hawthorne, and this is called Andromeda Speckle, and I'm not sure what this one is. I don't, I don't see the labels anymore. Um, but these are the two colors that I'm striping with now, and that's what they will end with. I think the edging ends with this particular color, and I don't remember. If I can find the label, I'll put in what this is. But I do know this is Andromeda Speckle, and this is the Hawthorne something or other. It is 100% wool. It's very soft. Um, and I'll be glad when I'm done this shawl, because I've been working on this since vacation last year in September. Actually, I worked on it, and then I forgot about it and didn't pick it back up, got busy doing projects for Christmas, and picked it back up in January, but I'm ready for it to be done. So um, that's project number one. Project number two, last week I showed you this finished object, which is a cowl that I designed. The pattern will hopefully be released in the next week or so. I'm hoping for next week. But here is what it looks like. And it is a cowl. It's attached in the back, but you don't... Um, so it looks like a shawl without all the bulky hanging around your neck stuff. And this is done out of cotton. So I wanted to make a second one as a test knit just to make sure that everything worked with the pattern. So the yarn that I did this with is a Noro yarn, which is a Japanese yarn. And it's, this is a 70% cotton, 30% silk. I have two skeins of it because there's 116 yards Per skein. This is what the label looks like. So we can focus a little bit better. Mm. Anyway, um, some of it's in Japanese, so I can't read that far part to you, but the parts that are in English I read. So um, this is what the yarn looks like. I'm, I've almost finished the first ball. And it does not have a colorway, it just has a color number 117. This is what it looks like knitted up so far. This is the top. And I'm down into the ribbed eyelet stitches that are right here. Let me see if I can get behind here so I can open this up and you can see it a little bit better. So, and there's little peekaboo holes, um, little holes in the top here, and then it goes down to a rib stitch, and then it has um, some eyelet rib stitch here, and then it has some seed stitch, I think, after that, and then it has an edging. So it's a very simple pattern. 
Um, it'll be one that if you want to learn some basic stitches, it's a good one. So, um, like I said, this is a cotton silk blend, and I hope to get this done. It's, it, there's not that much more to go, so I'm hoping to have this finished this week. Um, my granddaughter modeled the other one for the for the picture for the pattern, but I'm hoping I can get this one finished for this week so she can model that one for me as well. So I have those two projects done, and then I have been working on my third Keeping You in Stitches shawl, which is another shawl pattern that I designed. Um, it is a four color shawl, but I've done it three different ways. So here's the current one that I'm working on, which is all in one color. And it's a little curly right now because it has not been blocked. And this is being knit in cloudboard fibers. It's 100% fine Highland wool. So it is soft, and it's a bunch of different lace pattern stitches. And there's 10 sections, and I believe I'm on section 6, 6 or 7. So I'm coming down the home stretch with it. But I wanted to show you the other two versions of this that I've made, because this is the shawl that this week is going to be our coupon, um, going to have a coupon code for. So it's normally a $5 pattern, but if you are interested, um, I will put the link below down in the description box to my Ravelry patterns. And if you click on the Keeping You in Stitches shawl and you decide you would like it, uh, put it in the coupon code KC50. It'll give you 50% off of the pattern. So here is the version of the pattern that I did. I want to make sure I show you the front and not the back because it's kind of hard to tell. Some, with some of the stitches, you could almost make it reversible. Yeah. Here's the one that is done in variegated colors. And this one has been blocked, so it looks bigger. I have to hold it way back so you can see it. You can see a little bit of color pooling in some places. So there's that one. And then I had the original, which was done in uh, Knit Picks Palette Yarn. And oh, I've got hair all over it because I have worn this one just recently. And this is Knit Picks Palette, which is a cheap wool, but it's nice too. It's, it's not quite as soft as the other one, but the other one was from a Knit Crate box. The purple and gray came from a Knit Crate box. Um, so here is, here is the one that was in four different colors. This was the original, and this one's probably my favorite because I do like it in the different colors. So, um, anyway, that is what the three of them look like. So again, if you would like a copy of that pattern, it will be on sale for this week only, so it will run from this Saturday today until next Saturday. It will end, will it be ending next Friday. So it will be ending on the 6th of April. So again, that coupon code is KC50 for that particular pattern. Then I have something, I've noticed a lot of the new subscribers are crocheters. Now I had told you that I, I'm not a real fancy crocheter. I don't crochet a whole lot. Uh, mostly granny squares and granny stripe type of blankets. Um, but I, I did want to make one of those granny stripe blankets that I've watched a lot of other podcasters make. So I bought a bunch of acrylic yarn because what I was going to make, with it being a blanket, I wanted something that was easily washable. Um, it's going to be a throw for down in our bedroom on one of our chairs. So um, I started to crochet. I watched a couple of tutorials um, because I started out with the granny square or the granny stripe blanket and I think most of the podcasters are doing it with a smaller needle and maybe fingering weight yarn. Mine looked just kind of chunky and I didn't like it so I ripped it apart and I'll show you in a minute what I'm doing instead. But I did want to tell you a little bit about the history of crochet. Um, now one of my 
early videos that I did, I had the history of crochet in it. So if you click on the little letter I that's up in the corner here, um, that will take you to that video and you can watch the history of crochet. I don't want to bore everybody with something I've told them before. Um, <coughs> so coughing. Anyway, um, I don't want to bore you all the things that I've showed before. So if you would like to hear more about the history of crochet, which was very interesting because it was not originally done uh, the way we do it now. It, it originally started looking like rug hooking, which is kind of interesting. They kind of did chain stitch with fabric in between and chained onto the fabric. It was really unique. It was kind of a cross between rug hooking and a needlepoint type of thing. Um, so anyway, if you click on the little eye, it will take you to it. I did want to thank a couple of viewers who gave me some crochet tips. Uh, one of those was Jane Daniels, who I had, I had made a mention about stitch markers. I didn't know if people who crocheted used stitch markers. And she said, yes, they do to mark the rounds. So I guess they're like removable stitch markers. So if you're knitting something circular, yes, you do use stitch markers to mark where you've completed your circle. And then I got another tip from Christy Gabani, I had made the comment that when I was crocheting straight across, I always lost track of what my last stitch was. And so I ended up with knitting triangles or knitting, you know, pyramids and triangles and odd shapes because I couldn't keep the, the sides straight. And she gave me the tip of also using removable stitch markers and marking the end and the the first and the last stitch of each row. That way when I get to the end, I know I am at the end and I can keep track of which the, which stitch is my last. So both of those I thought were great tips, which will help somebody like me out who is challenged in that way. So now on to show you what, what I am making. I decided to, to go a little bit fancier than a granny stripe. And years ago, they're now calling them chevron blankets, at least that's what it looks like in Ravelry. When I was a kid in the 70s, I remember my mother making these, everybody made these, and they were called ripple, um, they were called ripple afghans, um, and there was another name for them. They were called ripples or zigzags, that's what it was, ripples or zigzags. So I am doing a chevron ripple zigzag granny stripe blanket. So here it is. I've got eight rows so far. These are the eight colors that I'm using because my bedroom is done in fall colors and I have a fall quilt that I made on our bed. Somebody asked in the questions, am I still quilting? I quilted a king size bed. I haven't picked up quilting since then. That was a couple of years ago. I got a little burned out with it. I'll get back to it, but I was so like overwhelmed with that that I didn't want to look at quilting for a while. Um, the video that I watched that I learned to do this with uh, was a video put out by Christy Simpson. Um, she did a tutorial on how to do this and it was very easily explained, especially for someone like me. I am going through the back or the front loop so that I get this little, like a little ridge because I just liked, you can see it a little bit, I liked the ridge color in it. Now, if you all have some tips, please feel free to share with me. This is not overly wide. It's maybe three and a half feet. I totaled up my yarn. I have eight skeins of yarn that I'm using. I've got roughly 2,000 square, or 2,000 square feet. I have roughly 2,000 feet, yards, yeah. Let's try this again. I have roughly 2,000 yards of yarn between all eight skeins. Now I know crocheting uses a third more yarn than knitting does. Knitting, I could easily pretty much gauge what size blanket I'm going to come out with. This one, I'm not so sure because I don't know how much yarn is going to be used with the crocheting. So I'm trying not, I didn't want to make this overly wide and end up with a itty bitty narrow, you know, little, little afghan that just fit across the bottom of the bed to keep our feet warm. I wanted to have something more like a throw. So I'm not making it overly wide so I can make sure I have enough to at least get it square if possible. So, uh, Hopefully I'm going to have 
enough because I bought the yarn on clearance. Some I know I can get other places, but because a lot of it's like red heart, some of it's patents, but it might be just continued patents. Um, so anyway, that is my crochet project, and I got to cro show you my crochet hook. Watch this. Yes, it lights up. I can crochet in the dark. I feel like E.T. phoning home. Yes, or if I have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I can light my crochet hook to get there. Um, I did look into it. This is It is a light on your crochet hook so that you can crochet in the dark. But a friend of mine said it would also come in handy if you were crocheting dark um, stitches, like right here I'm doing, <coughs> like here I'm doing in the brown. Um, or if you were crocheting, like, you know, any kind of dark color that's not going to maybe show up the stitches as well, you could light the light and crochet in the dark. So that is my crochet project that I've got going on. And I thought I would show you some of my grandmother's doilies. Now, I did try to pull some doilies that are not in the video that I linked up above because I did so show some of her doilies then. And um, my grandmother lived in an apartment. Most of I mean, she lived in a house when I was real little, but most of the years that I re really have memories of her, she lived in an apartment. And she would block her doilies, because that's mostly what she would knit some afghans, but most of the time she knitted doilies. Um, she would block them on her carpeting. I remember going over her house, and they would be all over the carpet, like pinned to the carpet drying. So... Um, I always wondered, why did she put doilies on the backs of her chairs? She would have them laying over the back of the sofa, over the back of the chair. And in the history that's linked to that video above, it explains why, but I will, in case you don't link to that, I will explain it really fast. It turns out during the late 1800s, during the Victorian era, it was really popular for men to use grease in their hair, especially bear grease, to slick their hairstyles you know, the hair down, and then they would sit against the high-backed Victorian furniture, and their grease would get into the upholstery. So women started making these doilies, and they called them anabaskers, and they would put them on the backs of the furniture so that if men happened to lean back, the grease wouldn't ruin their sofas. So my grandmother, I was trying to figure it out, I think she was born around 1916, so she would have remembered my great-grandmother putting these doilies on the backs of the chairs. So I'm thinking that's why she just did it, maybe because that's what she was used to seeing. So this one is especially tiny and fine, especially the center part. I mean, it's almost, I can't even imagine what size she did this with. It is so very, very tiny. I can't even get it to film really well. It is... It is like minuscule. I can't even, I can barely tell the stitches it's that, it's that tight. But you can see this is very, very fine. And this whole doily is more like a coaster size. Maybe five, six inches across. So that's one. Then I have this one. I'll bring it a little closer so you can see it has like little little bobbles on it right in here. So it's kind of textured. Kind of reminds me of like little fruit along the edges. So you, here you can see it. it. Looks like little grape clusters. And this one is two toned. I can hold this up. You can see it changes color. It starts, it starts a cream and then it goes out to a tan. And this also has some texture along the edges here. There you can see it really, really well. And it has like a pico edging to it. And then there's like these flowers where these come out. If you look at them now that I now that I'm looking at it in the in the uh, monitor, I can see it. 
This is a flower, and here's the leaves. So there you can see it. And then there's this other one. Like I said, I have, I have several of them. When she passed away, I found them in some stuff, and nobody else wanted them. We were all going through her things, and my aunt had some stuff that nobody else wanted, and I said, well, I would like those. So this is the other one. And it's kind of a swirled pattern. And I do use some of these. I don't put them on the backs of my chairs. Um, I put them out on my table my, for a centerpiece or on my coffee table and stuff like that. So I do have some other ones, and I'm hoping these are not ones that you've seen before from the other video. Um, I tried to grab some different ones. So a couple of my grandchildren came over and spent a few days with me, and one of them was my granddaughter. Uh, my granddaughter is 14, almost 15, and she's part of a 4-H fiber club. So she does a lot of needle felting, and I gave her my um, the hoop looms, the, you know, the round looms that are plastic that you do the loop, to, loop overs with. Um, I gave her my set of that and of those. I had like a set of three. And she has really enjoyed making hats with those. So while they were staying with us, she and I decided to do a little yarn dyeing. Um, now, I've dyed yarn before, and I will put another one of those little cards up here if you would like to see the tutorial for dyeing plain yarns. Now, I don't, I'm not a fancy yarn dyer. I don't use acid dyes. I use plain old food coloring that you can buy at the grocery store and white vinegar because you do have to set the yarn in white vinegar and water solution before you dye it so that it will absorb and take the dye. So if you would like to watch that process of how to do um, just regular dyeing um, of individual skeins, um, if you click the little card right there, it will take you to the tutorial. And I will show you in a few minutes what we came up with. These are the yarns that I dyed individually. I made these for my cozy memory blankets. These are dyed with Cloudborn. Uh, they are 100% Highland Peruvian Peruvian Highland wool, and uh, they are soft. They are fingering weight um, or sport weight, pretty close, and they are going to be used in my cozy memory blanket. Um, most of the yarns that are for my cozy memory blanket, apparently I like jewel tones, so I have a lot of darker colors, and I wanted to have some lighter colors to put into it to intermix. So I have this pastel yellow, and you can see it's kind of tonal. You can see there's a little bit of a little bit of different shades of yellow. And then there's this one, which is the same yellow, but it's got some like spots and speckles. There you can see some speckles in there of some other darker yellows. And then we have this green, which I really think is kind of cool. It has speckles. There you can see a speckle uh, right here. Some speckles in it. There's a bunch of speckles right over in here. So there's speckles. If you see me looking off to the side, I'm checking the monitor to make sure it's showing up with the camera right. Then we did pink, and we made sure to keep some of it white so that it's kind of candy cane-ish. And then I have just a tonal, kind of a pistachio color green. And then this one's kind of fun. It's grays, and it has a little bit of blue mixed in it. You can see some of the blue coming through, like right where my fingers are. So it's kind of gray. Kind of looks like a stormy day. There's some white in it, like clouds. <coughs> so it's kind of a purpley gray with some blues. And then we had this one. This we had fun with. My granddaughter and I just took all of the, we took the yarn, laid it out, and just put little squirts of dots from the food coloring all over on this. It was the hardest to get the dye back out of when we were finished. It kept dripping color, so we kept having to rinse it and rinse it. But is that cool or what? We had lots of fun with that one. 
And then the yarn you're going to see the two of us dyeing in the in the video I'm going to show in a minute. Um, my version came out this color because I'm using a different wool than she is. My granddaughter's project that she wanted gradient yarn done from was a Manos del Uruguay yarn, um, which is a different type of sheep. Hers was a super wash merino, or super fine merino. It wasn't a super wash. It was a super fine merino, where this is a highland yarn. So it depends. Even though they're both soft wools, they they feel hers was much softer than mine was, even though mine's not scratchy at all. Mine's I mean, you could wear it against your skin with no problem. Um, hers is even softer because a merino is like the finest wool you can get. And hers was a different weight as well. So hers was not, I think this is a two-ply. This is a two-ply yarn, which means it's two strands twisted together. Hers was single. So, and hers was probably an Aran or DK, probably an Aran weight. It was slightly heavier than worsted. Um... So, and she needs the chunkier yarn to, to do for the, um, the loom that she uses. So, that being said, I'm going to insert the tutorial of the two of us dyeing together gradient yarn. And you'll see pictures of it at the end, what it looked like. When we got started, this is the yarn. Uh, this is my yarn that I'm going to be dyeing. But we actually soaked it in the sink with a mixture of water and vinegar because the vinegar helps the dye to set. And we're not using any special type of dye. I am just using plain old food coloring. This is by Spice Supreme. Uh, it's just some cheap stuff I found in the grocery store. It's just your plain old food coloring. We're just wearing gloves so that we don't stain our hands. Um, so... That is how we are getting this set up, and it is on, you can't see it so much here, but it's on plastic wrap, so we're not dying directly on the counter. We actually have the plastic wrap underneath it, and it will get wrapped up and microwaved. We are going to be dyeing a gradient yarn. This is Manos de, del Uruguay. It is a Maxima, and it is an an Aran weight yarn. It's a hundred percent super fine merino. And here's what we've done. We've got it all laid out across the table here. And we're going to start with white so we won't be doing anything. And then it's going to gradually get a little bit darker. So my granddaughter's going to demonstrate what we're going to do. She's going to first put, we have a bottle, a little glass of water here. She's going to try one drop in it first. And then we're going to mix it. Okay. And then she's going to use the little suction bulb. And she's going to apply a little bit of it to the second. Like I said, this one's going to be staying white, so we aren't doing anything to that. This one's going to be the lightest. So once she has some in there, then she's going to squish it around and then gradually add more color as she needs to. And you'll notice there's a, a yarn thread between these. This will allow, the blue from here will bleed gently a little ways into here, as well as a little ways into this side, where this will become darker. might want to just soak the, just the edges here a little bit on the, the sides here so that they start to get in there. A little bit more squishing. Kind of turn it around some. You don't want to do it too much because you'll end up with uh, 
having it felt. But you do want to make sure you have it all completely covered. So I might need a little bit more yet. Okay, see if we can get a little bit more of this. You just want to really turn it around to make sure you don't have any spots that don't have color to them. right here and in there maybe it's stuck to be <laughs> that look good mm -hmm. okay next one we're going to move to you're going to add another just one more drop And mix again and we're going to continue this all the way across just adding additional drops and saturating so once we get to that point we will show you what it looks like okay here we go we have finished we have the white and then it's moving progressively darker and darker so it gets to, this is actually like a deep turquoise. So let me stand back here so you can kind of see all the colors together. Now my granddaughter is going to show you what we're going to do for the next step. She is folding the plastic wrap over on both sides. You want to completely seal the yarn in the plastic wrap. Don't bleed from one to the other when we microwave them. Kind of looks like sausages. Turquoise sausages. We are going to carry this over to the microwave. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're going to put it in the microwave. I'm going to try to fill it up here so you can see it. that color is not dyed anyway. And then we're going to set it for two minutes. And then we'll take it out. And so my granddaughter is going to take this out of the microwave and she's going to use some tongs uh, because this is going to be hot. And she's going to be dumping it into the sink with some cold water and let it cool for a second because you can have the, the steam can be too hot and you could burn yourself. What if we take the whole plate, take the whole base of the microwave out? That'll work. <laughs> so here it is, microwaved. And now we're going to dump it into the cold water to cool down a little bit before we open it up. Here's the finished product. There's the white and then it moves through to the different gradients. 
to the darker. We did lose a lot of color with this particular yarn. But it's this is almost like a, a sea foam color. And then it's these are all kind of sea foam colors, and then it moves up to here, which is the darkest of the sea foam colors. So at this point, those are our gradients. We're going to wind it together so that it looks like a regular hank of yarn like this. And we can then uh, hang it to dry. And then we will ball the yarn up when we get it dry probably tomorrow. Interesting. This yarn that my granddaughter is using is a super fine merino wool. This is the cheap wool that um, yarn you can get from Knit Picks. This is Bear and it's Highland Peruvian uh, Highland yarn. It's wool. It's a both of these are 100% wool, but this is from the merino sheep and this is from the Peruvian Highland sheep. This is the same dye lot. But look at the difference in color. This one did not take the color as well and when we rinsed it a lot of the color came out. This one is from like I said the same cup of dye and when I washed it out very little dye came out and it maintained the deep color. So just to show you the comparison here. projects or products. We have a pink that is has some white blended in it so it's like a pink marbled. Kind of looks like cotton candy. Then we have this one that we the two of us just speckled straight food coloring. We didn't water it down or anything and it's in all four colors of the speckles. This is one of my favorites. I think it's really cool. And then we have this that's just in a tonal uh, turquoise. Then we have two yellows here. This yellow has some dark speckles. You can see some right here. So it has some dark speckling in parts of it. And then we have this that is just the plain yellow. Then over here we have a plain green. It's kind of a pistachio. There you can see it. Pistachio green. And here we have one that is kind of a purple purpley blue and it has some white marbled areas in it as well. Then over here we have another green but as you can see we have like dark spots of darker green in it and up top hanging across here is the yarn that my granddaughter dyed in the gradient and that is you know it's like sea foam, tones of sea foam. It goes from white to a darker sea foam. The rest is my messy laundry room. Now the first week that we were doing the giveaway, I had asked you all to put questions down for me. And a lot of those questions I didn't answer because I was going to answer them and I am going to answer them in a later video. But as time has gone on and the questions have piled up, I've started answering some of those questions. But one question was asked this week that I thought was good, um, and I did answer it to an extent on, on YouTube. I thought I would answer it a little bit better now. So the question was, is all 100% wool scratchy? The answer is no. Um, so I thought I was going to show you a few different types of wool and what makes yarn scratchy and what makes it not scratchy. Um, first off, wool doesn't always have to come from a sheep. You can have wool, um, I mean primarily it's from sheep, but you can have wool from camel, from muskox, angora and cashmere are also classified as wool, so is mohair, so is, um, I don't know, did I already say angora? Um, anyway, and I'm wearing a little capelet that is made with Angora. And you can see, maybe you can see, 
the fuzziness, the halo that's up here. Yeah, there you can see it. This, this kind of fine sheen, that's just because it's very long fibered. You can see it. That's not my hair coming off. That is fiber um, from the Angora. It's very soft. It's very snuggly. So, um, yeah, I'm wearing it upstairs today because it's chilly up here. Anyway, um, I do spin. I have a spinning wheel. I haven't done any demonstrations lately of spinning, but I pulled some of my yarn or some of my fibers up to kind of show you the difference. Um, the scratchiness of wool depends on several factors. First off, it depends on the sheep breed itself because some sheep breeds have shorter fibers. Some have longer fibers. The longer fibered sheep are usually softer. Um, they also depends on how much crimp is in the wool itself. Crimp being little curlies. Um, the more curliness to the to the or crimp to the wool, the softer it's going to be because it allows more air into the fiber as you as it gets spun. So it's lighter and fluffier, which makes it softer. Um, and the longer the fiber, they don't have to twist it as tight to um, put it together as a yarn, where shorter fibers have to be spun at a faster rate, just like cotton. When you spin it, cotton is only about well, maybe inch and a half to two inches long on average. So cotton, you have to spin at a very high rate of speed. Short fibered wools, you have to do the same thing. So it depends on what fiber, depends on what sheep. Um, it also depends on where they took the fleece from on the sheep. If they took the top coat, which would be the sheep's back, its neck, its haunches, those are the softest parts of the fleece. If they took the yarn, if they took the, the yarn, if they took the fleece from the undercoat, which is the belly and the legs and the head, those are the coarser sections of the fleece. So those are going to be rougher, even after they're cleaned. They also tend to be the more dirty areas of the fleece. So those are going to be the cheaper fleeces are going to be coming from the undercoats. Um, they're going to be coarser. Now I have just some rovings here to show you. Now a roving is, I'll hold some of these up. A roving is fiber that has been processed and combed and cleaned and it's ready to be pulled out like this and drafted and spun. Now this is extremely soft. This is a blended merino and you can see this is just very very soft. This, you can see it looks a little coarser just to see it. You can see it's a little little fuzzier. It's It's got a halo to it. This has a big halo to it. This is a little bit, but it's, and it's still soft, but it's not as soft as this. This came from a black Welsh mountain fleece, and this is natural color for that particular sheep. But it's not as, it's, like I said, it's soft, but it's not as soft as this. Um, this one is, this is a merino. This also, you can see a halo. You can see a little bit of fuzz to it. This is very soft. It feels almost like flannel. But if you look at this, this fleece here, or this roving here coming off, and compare it to here, you can see a difference. You can see the fibers flying all over the front. I'll probably be sneezing very shortly. Um, and then I have some cheaper fleece that I bought some rovings. These I got off of eBay. And you can see that this, this almost feels it's... It's not scratchy, but it almost feels like it's almost synthetic, and it's it's tighter to pull out. It is fleece, but it's not as high grade. It's definitely not a merino. Um, it's not as soft as any of the other ones that I've showed you. So there are differences. And then I have this one. This is alpaca. This is like one of the softest fibers you can ever spin. The only other ones that are softer are the a vicuña and a kiviet, and they're ex very very expensive. Um, you want to if you want a cheap yarn to try to knit with or crochet with. Um, when I say cheap compared to what those are, those could go for over a hundred dollars an ounce to knit. 
Um, so alpacas a lot more, a lot more in the range to knit with. You can get them reasonably, um, priced. In fact, um, Ella Ray Yarns sells a baby alpaca that is very nice to knit with. Um, but this, you can see a nice halo coming off. It's very fluffy. This is extremely soft. So I have not spun this yet. I got this at a local alpaca farm that's just around the corner from where I live. When yarn is spun, um, the other thing that can make a difference, if you notice those yarns, the fibers are already all going the same direction. If the person that's spinning it is spinning them with the fibers going all the same direction, they lay flat, and as a result, they stay smooth, and it makes it so it's not scratchy. If it's a cheaper fiber, and it's not necessarily combed all as well, yarn, uh, wool has barbs in it. That's what makes it scratchy and prickly feeling. And some of the cheaper yarns, they don't have them combed as well sometimes, and they can be a little on the bristly side. This is a cheaper yarn. I got this at a warehouse. Yes, here we go. Okay. You can see right here. Ignore the glare coming off of here. But you can see kind of bristly fibers. That's not a halo coming up. You can see kind of bristliness coming off the yarn right in here. Right in here. This is a coarser yarn. This is, like I said, this is not a halo. This is not uncomfortable to wear. I have a sweater out of this. It's a cardigan. I would not have made a pullover out of this. Um, but I do have a sweater out of this. Um, it's not as soft. This is what you would call probably scratchy or rustic yarn. Um, it's heavy duty. It's a workhorse yarn. It's something, but it's something you want for outerwear. So it's a tougher, it's a tougher wool. Those other wools are going to wear easier because they're finer. Um, they're what you would more consider your luxury wools. This is your everyday wool. That's kind of the differences. So hopefully that answered some questions. So 100% wool can, can be soft, but it can be scratchy too. It depends on how it's processed, the, the sheep it came off of, where it came off of the sheep, and how it was spun together. Okay, so I hope that answered your question. Now we're on to acquisitions. I had fun this week. First off, I had told you a few weeks ago that I wanted to get some polymer clay because I wanted to start making some stitch markers with all the cute little food things and all the little the cute stuff. My polymer clay came in. I got this off of eBay. I forget what I paid for it. I buy a lot off of eBay. It's cheap. Um, I haven't started making anything with it because I'm still waiting for the little eye screws that will hook into the the little clasps. So I can't do anything until they come because you have to kind of make these with you, so you can insert this while the clay is still wet. So I look forward to playing with this. But what did come in was my eye cord knitter. And I talked about this a few weeks ago. So I thought I would demonstrate it to you. This is what it looks like. I got this off of eBay. I will put a link down below in the description box if you're interested. I paid $11.49 for, for it. It came relatively quickly. Now you may say, what is an I-cord knitter? Let me show you this really close. You see this really fine knitted tube right here? This is I-cord. What it is, it's a series of four stitches that are knit around and around and around. You see this used for drawstrings, like on your hoodies that go through the hood. Um, you could use this uh, to sew onto the edging of a shawl or a blanket. This I do have to say this is narrower than what I was expecting. I thought it was going to knit a little wider than this. Um, they have used it in the instruction book. They have used it to sew it into, make it into like little frogs for clasps. So they, sh and they show you how to do that. They have the little directions for how to make a little Celtic knot. 
So they show you the designs for doing that and how to do these. But you could make button loops out of it. You could take several of them and braid them together and make a handle. So I thought I would show you how this works. There are four needles. Let me see if I can turn this. There's four needles in here. Right. One, two, three, and four. And they raise. You can see that I've got one in there raised right now. They raise and they catch the yarn that is being threaded from the ball. So I'm going to crank this. Once you have it um, woven, you know, started in here, it's basically, they call it casting on. You cast on those four stitches. Then it is just a matter of cranking it. And it has this clothespin. Now this is a weighted clothespin. There's weights in the handle here so that it keeps tension drawn back on this. So after that, you just turn it. And I'm going to see if I can tip this and still do this so you can see the machine. There we go. You can see the machine coming up and grabbing it. And you can go much faster than what I'm going. But And then your eye cord comes out the bottom here. This is much faster than if you try to hand knit this. I have hand knit eye cord before, but never something this fine. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll get some use out of this. But I thought it was kind of a unique tool. I saw it on someone else's podcast. I think it was Sheepish, Sheepishly Sharing had one. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? It looks like that could be an, a fun thing to have around. You know, not that I put eye cord on a lot of things. But if I do, I will have an eye cord knitter. But I, I can think of other crafts I could do using this. Like I said, you could even take loops of it and sew them together and make like flowers. All kinds of stuff you could do with it. And because it's a hollow tube, you could weave um, even wire up in the center of it so that you could like shape, you know, make them so that they look more like flowers. I don't know. thought it would be kind of fun. So that's my new toy that I got for my acquisitions. Sorry, I keep taking breaks to take something to drink because I'm drying out a lot today. Now, I have some very, very exciting news this week. Last week I told you I was a, a new affiliate for Knit Crate and for Craftsy. And for those of you who ordered from Craftsy last week through my link, thank you so much. I really do appreciate that. Um, so I thought I would give you the coupon codes for this week because I checked to see who's having sales and everything. And Craftsy is having um, their coupon of the week. If you click down in the description box in the Craftsy, um, it says Craftsy, there's a link. If you click on that link, it will take you to their sales of their supplies for this week. I don't think it's a certain percentage off or anything. They've just got all of those supplies that show up on that link are on sale and it has the sale prices there. So if you buy something through those links, because I am an affiliate, I would get like a commission out of it. But I do buy from Craftsy. Um, when I decided to, to try to become a, an affiliate for all three of these companies, I did so because I like all three of those companies, and I have bought from all of those companies on a, on a fairly regular basis. Because um, I don't want to recommend something to you that I haven't tried myself or that I don't like myself. So um, those are, that is the link for Craftsy. And then I checked um, Knit Picks because I noticed last week's question for our giveaway was, what kind of yarn do you knit with the most? And an overwhelming group of you are knitting with worsted weight wool. Well, it just so happens Knit Picks is having a sale on their wool of the Andes. Um, it is a worsted superwash, which means even though it's a wool, it's treated so that you can put it in the machine, in the washing machine. Um, they are having a sale. It's a 50 gram ball. It is $3.69 and it's 110 yards per skein. And there was tons of colors when I checked it out because I wanted to make sure it was, you know, there was a lot of selection. There's a lot of colors to choose from. So that link is also down below under Knit Picks. And if you click through that, that'll take you right to that particular page where they're having that sale on their worsted weight wool. And then here is the most exciting of them all. Knit Crate contacted me and asked, would I like to be an associate? 
as well as, or, or not an associate, an ambassador, as well as an affiliate. Could they send me three months of free yarn boxes? Yes, please. Yes, please. They are going to do this. That is so exciting. Um, they had contacted me and said uh, that they would like to send me three, a minimum of three months of one of their their um, knit crate boxes. And at first they offered me the membership box. And I told them, I said, well, I already received the membership box, you know, and I do an unboxing of that on my channel already. So they said, oh, well, would you like a different box? I was like, sure, I'll take whatever you would like to send me. So they offered me their sock crate box or their artisan box. So I'll tell you about all four boxes and I'll tell you which one I got. Okay, the artisan box is an independent dyed, it's from an independent dyer. It is one yarn, one skein of yarn. Um, and it comes with, uh, let me see what I got it written down here. It comes with a treat and it comes with two knitting patterns. Okay, it runs $34.99 per month. Uh, the membership box, which is the box I get, is $24.99 a box, or, yeah, per box, which is once a month. It is two skeins of yarn that are specially dyed. They're not dyed by an independent dyer, but I've been happy with them. You know, I've gotten um, two different types of boxes um, in the, I guess I've been with them about nine months now. I started out with the Knitology box, and then I changed over to the membership box probably about five months ago. And I've been thrilled with it. It's two skeins of yarn. I've liked everything I've gotten. Um, I've knitted with a good bit of it. So I've been happy with it. They give you a crochet pattern and a knit pattern every month. So you get the yarn and you get a knitting pattern and a crochet pattern. Uh, you just have to download the pattern and they're usually a five to ten dollar pattern from Knit Crate. So um, it's very reasonable. It really is. Um, even the other box that's $34.99 when you figure it's independently dyed. Independent dyers charge $26 per skein, and then you're getting some extras on top of it. Um, the sock crate, which is the one I got, um, well, they have two sock crates, so I'm not sure which one I'm getting. Okay, there's, There is one sock crate, which is an independent dyer, and again, that is independent dyed yarn, so that's going to be the more expensive version of it. Um, it has a treat, and it has a sock pattern included, and it's $23.99. And then their cheapest is the Knitology Sock Crate, which is $19.99. And that is just from their in-house yarns, which is the Knitology brand. Um, I started out with those, and there was only two that I got that I wasn't overly thrilled with when I first got them. And then I knitted with them, and I made them into stuff, and I really liked them once I, once I started using them. When I first saw them in the skein, I didn't care for them. But I made one into a sweater. In fact, it matched this color yarn. Um, so um, you can see that in some of my other videos. But um, anyway, I got the sock crate yarn. So that will be coming soon. So we will be having two unboxings a month. Because I've always unboxed my membership box. So now I'll be I will be unboxing my membership box and the sock crate box when they send it to me. But here's what they did on top of that. If you all are interested in trying Knit Crate, they are offering you a 20% discount on your first box. Yes, that's how I got started. I saw it on another podcast. I heard this deal and I thought, can't go too far wrong. If I don't like it, I'll cancel it. So um, I tried it for a month and I kept on going with it. Um, <clears throat> like I said, when you figure out the cost of the yarn, and these are luxury yarns, they're not, they're not cheaper yarns. They are all like merinos, and um, some of the yarns I've gotten have been absolutely gorgeous. So um, actually, most of the yarn I've gotten has been absolutely gorgeous. So I also look back and see my knit crate unboxings in the playlist. I will again put a little card up here 
I've got lots of cards this week. Put a little card up here, and you can check that out if you want to see what kinds of yarn I've gotten over time and um, decide that for yourself. But anyway, they have offered you 20% off your first box. So again, the link to that with that coupon I will put in the description box down below. So I am looking forward to getting that. When I get my boxes in, I usually open them like in, in a midweek, and then I just show them the final like open version on the regular Saturday podcast. For what everybody's been waiting for, the last clue of the week uh, for our last week of the yarn giveaway. And that would be, you must be a subscriber, so if you haven't already clicked that little red button, do so. Give me a thumbs up. Don't do this. Do this. Give me a thumbs up. And thirdly, leave me a comment down below telling me where you're from. I did that in one of my other videos, and I just thought it was really fun to see where all over the world everybody was coming from. That was exciting for me to be able to go, oh, I've got, I've got somebody in, the, in South Africa. Somebody from South Africa talked to me this week. Um, you know, and I've got some people in South America, and I've got people in the Netherlands, and, and I'm talking with somebody who's in Australia. There was somebody from Australia this week, so hello. Um, so yes, I'm having all kinds of fun. It just fascinates me that we've got this knitting community, and we all chit-chat back and forth like a knitting circle, but we're like from all over the world. So um, yeah, that's what you have to do this week. Click the subscribe button if you haven't. Give me a thumbs up, and tell me in the comments where you're from. So that's it for this week. Come back next Saturday for our, our drawing to see who won. And um, good luck to everybody. And have a wonderful Easter with your family this weekend. Bye, guys. I love Mama. Oh. Oh. Love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs>